We're coming on the air with a, quote, apocalyptic scene in Maripol, Ukraine. That's how the Red Cross is describing it after a maternity hospital was destroyed today. We'll show you the heartbreaking pictures from inside the wreckage as we're getting an exclusive look at a new interview with Ukraine's president. And as the White House deals with the controversy over those Polish jets, we've got new details on how President Biden is shifting his strategy over skyrocketing gas prices. There's another issue on the president's mind today, cryptocurrency, with a new executive order trying to find ways to regulate the digital money. Ahead, how the White House is embracing crypto, as millions of Americans do, too. Plus, defense attorneys for the men accused of trying to kidnap Michigan's governor say the government made the whole thing up. Why the alleged kidnappers are using a so-called entrapment defense in court today. And Black Panther director Ryan Coogler is speaking out against Atlanta police tonight after he was mistaken for a bank robber. How he's reacting later in the show. Hey there, I'm Stephanie Goskin for Hallie Jackson, and we're going to get right to these devastating shots of a maternity hospital in Maripol that Ukraine says was destroyed by Russian airstrikes. This video, shared by Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, takes you inside. You can see the floor ripped up. There's debris everywhere. Zelensky says there are children under this wreckage, though NBC News can't confirm those details. You hear the crash and alarms blaring. The missile left a giant crater outside and ripped apart nearby cars. And we want to warn you, this next video clip is disturbing. Local officials say 17 people were hurt altogether. You see a woman crying, holding her child there, another person getting her head wrapped. A pregnant woman is being carried out on a stretcher. The World Health, Health Organization says 18 health officials excuse me, facilities in Ukraine have seen attacks like this since the war began. And even though there is a ceasefire along so-called humanitarian corridors, you're seeing them here letting civilians get out of the country. The mayor of one eastern Ukrainian town says it's tough for people to leave safely because there has still been Russian shelling on some of these routes. Later in the show, we're going to tell you more about the history of these humanitarian corridors and why some Ukrainians don't trust them. But first, we'll start in Lviv, Ukraine, with Matt Bradley. Matt, I want to play some of that exclusive interview our colleagues at Sky News got with Vladimir Zelensky, where he describes what's happening in Maripol. Here it is. They want us to feel like animals because they blocked our cities, the biggest cities in Ukraine, and uh, they blocked and and uh, because they don't want our our people to get some food, water. Yesterday, for example, children. I don't know if you, if you know the children in Mariupol was mm -hmm. uh, the child was dead. Matt, what he's describing there sounds like absolute hell. Can you tell us what is going on in Mariupol? Yeah, I mean, what he's describing is there, there is the issue of the bombardment, which we saw the bombardment of that maternity ward or that children's hospital uh, that injured 17 people. You know, Stephanie, I expect that those casualty numbers are going to go up, unfortunately. But that's only part of the problem in Mariupol. The a big problem is the lack of food, the lack of water, the lack of electricity. And that is what is causing starvation, essentially. Uh, dehydration, a young girl was dehydrated and died, and I believe that's what the president was just referring to in that in those comments. Um, and also just the fact that nobody can get medicine. People who are in desperate need of medication aren't able to get that from the outside. Because remember, Stephanie, with those humanitarian corridors being unsuccessful, they can't get people out. That also means that they can't get any humanitarian goods in. So that means that these people are starving of food, starving of medicine, and a lot of them need water. Now, we heard from the deputy mayor just a moment ago on MSNBC saying that people there were excited because snow had fallen which meant that they could go out and collect snow and melt it down for drinking water. That is just how desperate people are there. So again, the bombardments are a major threat, but also just the lack of humanitarian access is going to be killing people. It's going to become lethal. There's 400,000 civilians in Mariupol, and there's an effort to try to get half of them, 200,000 of them out. And so far, over the better part of a week, those efforts to establish humanitarian corridors have failed. The Ukrainians say because of Russian shelling, the Russians blame it on the Ukrainians. Hard to imagine why the Ukrainians would jeopardize their own humanitarian efforts to save their own people. But in this situation, it's hard to tell anything at all. 
But the fact is, is that no matter who's firing, no matter what is going on, it is the civilian population of this southern city that are carrying the bulk of the burden. Stephanie? Yeah, they, they, they certainly are. And what's grim is only going to get grimmer if they can't get them out. I want to turn to something else, Matt. U.S. officials are saying that the Russians could be preparing to use chemical and biological weapons in Ukraine. What generated those concerns? Yeah, I mean, the chemical and biological weapons, these are warnings that we've been getting for quite a while, of course. Remember, this is the Russian military. We believe that the Syrians use chemical weapons in Syria and that they were doing so with the blessing or with the aid of the Russian military. And one of the things we heard was that because of the Russians were... Uh, were warning that it was the U.S. that were going to be using chemical weapons, that they were going to be using chemical, they were planning on using chemical weapons in order to kind of stage it as like a false flag attack. And this is something that is straight from the Russian playbook that we've seen time and time again. Now, nuclear weapons, we already heard that Vladimir Putin has put his nuclear arsenal on notice as part of his general uh, sort of warlike posture that he announced several weeks ago. So, you know, all of this is in play. And as the Kremlin and as Vladimir Putin himself becomes more and more frustrated, he becomes more and more erratic. Stephanie? Yeah, and let's hope that doesn't lead to some kind of desperate move that involves those terrible weapons. Matt Bradley and Lviv, thank you. On the diplomacy front, Vice President Kamala Harris is now in Poland. Her plane touched down just as we came on the air. Tomorrow, she's going to talk with Ukrainians who have escaped the violence at home. She'll also sit down with Poland's president, where it's all but certain that they're going to talk about this controversy over Polish fighter jets. Because yesterday, you heard it on the show, that Poland was going to send Soviet-made plans to an American air base in Germany to make their way eventually to Ukraine. But the U.S. just axed it, because as Pentagon Press Secretary John Kirby says, U.S. intel believed that transfer was, quote, high risk. The intelligence community has assessed that the transfer of MiG-29s to Ukraine may be mistaken as escalatory and could result in a significant Russian reaction that might increase the prospects of a military escalation with NATO. Andrea Mitchell joins me now. Andrea, thanks so much for taking the time to, to talk us through some of this stuff. It really you felt bet. this week like there was a lot of momentum toward getting these planes over to Ukraine, but it's almost like something happened in the last 24 hours that crossed the line for the U.S. What changed? And are you surprised by how this is playing out? I am so surprised by how this is playing out, but not, not surprised that this plan is not working. I'm surprised that it was even proposed by Poland. You had Secretary Blinken, Stephanie, over the weekend in Poland talking this through with them. There clearly was very little interest in NATO getting involved. You know that. That's the red line, and you know why. Uh, the president has said from the get-go, we don't want to go to war with Russia. And if NATO gets involved in Ukraine, which does not have NATO protection, it is not a NATO member, they're not part of the treaty, they don't get the defense if they're attacked, but they get help. They get help because they are our democracy. They are our ally. We are trying to help them with defensive weapons and have done, you know, a billion dollars worth of weapons just in the last year. That said, we, we were talking, talking about F-16s to backfill Poland, and then Poland would supply the MiGs if they wanted to do that because of their own concerns about their own security. And they want the F-16s, much better jets, obviously, than the, the older MiGs. What so, so effectively, Andrea, what they, were, what they were saying is they were going to move these MiGs to Germany and kind of leave it up to the U.S. to right. get them to Ukraine? And, and that would put it on us. This would be a U.S. base, Ramstein. I'm sure you've been there over many, many years of covering things overseas. And it's a U.S. base. It's not even a NATO base. They are MiGs, <laughs> Soviet-era <laughs> jets being flown to a U.S. base to be flown by U.S. pilots? I mean, who is going to fly them in? How would you get them there? To get them there from Poland, they have to be broken up. They have to be reassembled by people who know how to do that. Well, that could be done in Poland and then, you know, freight them in or carry them in. Or, but in any case, the thought is that Vladimir Putin has now said that that would be akin to attacking Russia with NATO weapons and would be a, a declaration of war. So even that was going to be risky. But if Poland did it, you know, they're the next door neighbor. But for U yeah. U.S. pilots yeah. to be flying MiGs in, I mean, there's no way to get them there. Plus, what Kirby said today and made very clear is they could be shot down. It's been described to our people as a suicide mission. The minute they got in the air and got up there, they could be, you know, shot down. Be unless mm -hmm. the way you create a no-fly zone is to 
take out the Russian air defenses first. Well, that would mean that we, or Poland, would be attacking Russia in Russia or in Belarus to take out their missiles, their anti-aircraft weapons to create the no-fly zone. And I mean, you know, it's interesting, say, Andrea. I, I think it really highlights in some ways this fine line that, that the Western governments are walking here, where they are providing military support of sorts, right? But yet they don't want to go too far and provide something that Putin might interpret as a gesture of war. That's a, that's a tough line to walk, right? Yeah, and you don't want to give him veto power, but you also don't want to cross your own red lines. The 30 NATO nations have said, every time I've been to NATO meetings in these last months, we're not going to put boots on the ground or planes in the air over Ukraine. And where this gets really complicated and messy is that the Secretary of State was just there. They didn't give him any heads up. They didn't give the Pentagon any heads up. Poland just declared this. We had a top State Department official testifying to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and they informed her of it, and she said, well, I don't know about that. I just left my office. I'm going to have to go back to my office to find out. You know, a little embarrassing. And then, and then you've got the vice president. So she made her big debut, the biggest debut, after some missteps in Guatemala with Lester Holt, you know, some months ago. Mm -hmm. Her biggest foreign policy debut was in Munich, and she did okay in, on the world stage. But now this was supposed to be a celebratory trip to Poland to talk about NATO unity. And we were told last night it was supposed to be about how we're all in lockstep. And on the eve of that, they do something without it, uh, pre announcing it, and she's landing really to disentangle yeah. this. Yeah, well, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult time and a, and a messy situation she's flown into. Thank you for yeah. walking us through it, Andrew. We really appreciate it. Today, another major U.S. company says it's going to scale back its business with Russia. Amazon taking new steps to distance itself from the country. Russians will no longer have access to Prime Video, and Amazon products will no longer be shipped to Russia or Belarus. People there also won't be able to order the video game New World, the only game Amazon sells in Russia. In a statement, the company says they'll continue to partner with organizations to help with the humanitarian effort in Ukraine. More than 100 companies companies have now ended their business in some capacity with Russia. On to gas prices in the U.S., hitting a record high for the second day in a row. On average today, $4.25 per gallon. That's up 59 cents since last week. So if you were out there with the average tank of gas filling it up this week, it would cost you almost $10 more than last week. That starts to hurt. This comes just a day after the president tried to reframe the conversation, blaming those skyrocketing prices on Vladimir Putin and warning oil companies against price gouging, using the Ukraine war as cover. If Americans will be paying more, the president said, they need to know who is behind it. And today we're learning new details about this deliberate change in messaging from the White House. Joining me now is Mike Memoli. Mike, nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. Stephanie. Good to be with you. So the White House has been talking about this shift in strategy for two weeks now. Why do they think they need to do it? And is it going to work? Well, Stephanie, when you saw the president announce yesterday that he was taking this action to ban Russian oil imports, it was something of a reversal, because for the more than first week of this Ukraine crisis, the president has been saying that all the sanctions they were announcing on a nearly daily basis were exempting Russian oil to try to avoid further instability in the oil markets. Well, you know what? That instability was happening anyway. But so when the president made this announcement, it also presented something of an opportunity uh, to realize this messaging shift that they had been de debating behind the scenes. The president yesterday referred seven times over the course of his remarks to Putin's war, and then he referred to the gas price hikes that we're seeing across the country as Putin's gas price hike. When he landed in Texas for an event on veterans, I asked him, what's your message to the American people about gas prices? And he, he was honest. He said, they're going to go up. Uh, but then he said, when I asked him what he's going to do about it, he said there's not much he can do in the near term, but it's Russia's fault. So there was obviously gas prices have been fluctuating over the course of his time in office. They were looking for a culprit, and this opportunity presented itself to really put all the blame on Russia. Now the question is whether there's steps they can take to actually make this easier for Americans who are feeling this pain at the pump. Right. We're not getting those answers right. just yet. For sure. You know, this shift comes as Americans are heading to the ballot box for primaries. The White House believes Americans are willing to pay more to squeeze Russia's economy. But do administration officials worry there is a point when Americans just simply get fed up with these high prices? 
Yeah, it was re interesting. We talked to some pollsters, my colleagues, Carol Lee, Kristen Welker, who had been working for the DNC and for Democratic candidates, and they said, right now, Americans are saying in their focus groups and their surveys that they are willing to pay a little bit more at the pump if it helps the situation with Ukraine, if it deprives Russia of the revenues it gets from oil. But they don't really know what the tipping point will be and how much, really, Americans are willing to pay. So it, you're also hearing that the White House not just point the finger at Putin, but also really warning oil companies not to do anything to take advantage of this, not to gouge prices further. Months ago, the president was doing things like writing to the Federal Trade Commission to call for an investigation into potential price gouging. Now you hear the White House increasingly making the argument against Republicans who say it's Biden policies that are to blame, saying that they have leases, they have all the opportunity to expand production already. It's not the White House that's standing in the way. Well, Mike, that back and forth is only going to get more heated in the weeks and months to, get, sure. to come. Mike Memley, thanks so much. You got it. The way we use money could be reimagined. The president signing an executive order on cryptocurrency today with two main goals, to find a way to regulate the digital currency and to explore a digital version of the dollar. This is a big deal because this is the first ever federal strategy on cryptocurrencies. Some in the finance industry say the crypto world has been known as the wild, wild west because there hasn't been much regulation. And already there are 4 million Americans invested. It's about six. 16 percent of the country. The White House also used this, this announcement to downplay concerns that Russia could use crypto to get around U.S. sanctions. To clarify all this and walk us through it is Jacob Ward. Jacob, thank you so much for joining me and, and talking us through it. It's complicated. Very complicated. <laughs> I mean, this is weird stuff. We expected the White House to get involved in some way, but the fact that they're both doing a regulatory uh, you know, memo and also talking about creating a new currency, all of that is pretty surprising. You also have the White House jumping in here. You've got millions of Americans invested in cryptocurrency. They're jumping in, and, and does it in some ways legitimize the future of crypto? I mean, this is where we're going. We better be prepared for it. Absolutely. I mean, when I was first reading this memo, it began, you know, I, I was assuming it would be about just looking out for the illicit uses of it, um, the possibility that we might need to up our enforcement game. But then, before long, you realize, no, 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 what I'm looking at here is actually an agency memo that's talking about investigating the possibility of creating our own central bank digital currency, an American crypto, almost replacing the dollar. And so when you look at this, you can imagine that the White House here is, is has it advisors that are saying not just we need to get on top of this Wild West thing, but we have to establish a national version of this currency uh, really, you know, surrounding it, co-opting it entirely. That's but a whole new thing. Explain this to me um, in, in real simple terms. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> you know, I have dollar bills. I don't, I rarely use them. I use my credit card. That seems digital enough for me. What's the difference between the dollar in your wallet and what this would be? Well, this would essentially cut out the middleman in all of those transactions. When you are using a dollar, uh, especially when you're going through withdrawing it from your bank or you are paying off a credit card, there are all these intermediaries right now that are the soul of the financial system. What this would do is it would do away with all of that. Instead, do away you, with the banks. Do away with the banks. I mean, this is the thing. It's really right. it's weird to say it out loud, but that's exactly right. It would do away right. with the banks. It would do away with credit card companies such that all exchanges would be directly between you and me and directly between me and the government. That means that my, you know, my, my stimulus check would not have to clear for a couple weeks in the bank. It wouldn't have to be mailed to me. It would be instantaneous. That would be a whole new okay, world. Okay, that sounds nice, except I kind of like my bank. I sort of like the security and protection of my bank. What could possibly go wrong with this? Well, we can certainly imagine, I mean, we wouldn't want to port over, and I'm sure the White House would say if it was sitting here, we would not want to port over the variability, the volatility that we've seen in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies recently. So they want to instead regulate it, make it part of the Federal Reserve's you know, remit to, to control this. But you also have to think that it would not only do away with, with banks and credit card companies, which are going to oppose this violently, by the way, mm -hmm. um, they also... It, it adds all kinds of weird tools to the Federal Reserve. Right now, the Federal Reserve, if it wants to fight inflation, can only raise interest rates or lower them, but it can't lower them below zero. This could conceivably make it possible to reduce the value of your money, like wipe out a couple of percentage points of your money if that served fiscal policy. And we've seen in other countries like China 
they already have a central bank digital currency like this. 140 million people are using it there. And in that country, they have something called the social credit system, where if you misbehave online, you can be punished by the government. Now, those two things have not been connected in China before, but we're talking about handing over, really, the wow. soul of money to the government. Now, all money is imaginary, really. The gold, the dollar, all of that is imaginary. But yeah. this is a whole new world uh, that, that could really rewrite the rules of global well, finance. A lot of, a lot of freshmen in college studying macroeconomics, heads just exploded <laughs> over that conversation. I'm glad I'm not there. <laughs> Thank you very much for Thanks, joining us. We really appreciate it. Coming up, the trial begins for four men accused of plotting to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Federal prosecutors say they planned it for months. Details on what happened in court ahead. Plus, a high-level American delegation makes a rare trip to hear this, Venezuela, and frees two detained Americans after talks with the U.S. More on their release and the very interesting timing of the trip. That's after the break. Defense attorneys in Grand Rapids, Michigan courtroom today accused the government of coming up with a fictitious plan to kidnap Governor Gretchen Whitmer in order to entrap their clients. In opening statements, the defense said FBI agents and informants targeted the, defend the defendants for their anti-government views and then coerced them further into the plot. They argued there was never a plan or a conspiracy to begin with, calling their clients comments which were actually recorded, quote, stone cr crazy talk while well, prosecutors said they were furious about COVID restrictions and their actions went well beyond just talk, including training exercises and practicing with explosives, all part of their plan, according to the government, to kidnap the governor from her summer home and blow up a nearby bridge so law enforcement couldn't respond quickly. Adam Fox, Barry Croft Jr., Daniel Harris, and Brandon Caserta face charges of kidnapping, conspiracy. Foxcroft and Harris are also charged with the conspiracy to use a weapon of mass destruction. Joining me now is Pete Willie. Williams. Pete, it's great to see you. Let's talk about this entrapment defense. They say the FBI and these informants coerced these men into planning a kidnapping and that it never was actually going to take place. How does the government have to prove that there was actually a real danger here to the Michigan governor? Well, the government has a pretty strong thing in, in its arsenal here because originally six men were charged with this plot, but two of them have since pleaded guilty and will testify at the trial and the government will say that they will testify that this is not a case of the informants egging them on, that these four did intend to do this. And as you say, it was more than just talk. They did the weapons training. They surveilled the governor's summer home from which they intended to kidnap her, according to the government. And they also uh, built it and set off explosives, practicing for an explosive to blow up the bridge. So the government says this went a lot, a way, way beyond talk. Now, there were, there's one interesting thing about this case, one sort of unusual thing about this case, uh, is that there were two undercover FBI informants who were meeting with these men and five other people who were acting as informants. So seven in all. And that cuts both ways because on the one hand, the government says, look at all this evidence we had of what they were up to. On the other hand, the defense says, look at all these people who were in on it, egging them on. Yeah, and, and it sort of looks like, oh, okay, well, who had the idea and then, and then who followed through with it? But it, they have beyond just recordings, they actually they have some video of, of this stuff going on, right? The surveillance and stuff? They, they have video. You just show just a little bit of it, of the training exercise video that was released by the government after the arrest of these men. And they also have all these recordings of the meetings, all their discussions. So there's, there's an, a lot of material because they were under such close surveillance. And the question in all of these entrapment cases, entrapment, a defense that, that seldom works, but it often comes up in these so-called sting cases or these cases where plots are discovered and then infiltrated by informants or, in this case, not only informants but two undercover agents, there always is this question of, well, you know, which was the chicken and which was the egg here? Who was suggesting what to whom? And that's what the trial will deduce. That's what the evidence will, will discover. The jury will have to find out whose idea this was and was the government, as it should be, a passive participant here listening and making sure that they didn't do anything illegal. I mean, one of the things that's common in these cases and apparently happened in this case is 
that when one of the conspirators is accused of wanting explosives, then the FBI will provide them something that's inert so that they can't do any damage to anybody else. But the government also says that in this case, the men did get some materials and try to build bombs of then set them off and, you know, practice to see if they could build bombs on their own. And regardless, building a bomb, Pete, is illegal, right? Yes, that's one of the many things that they're charged with. You mentioned earlier that the two of them face charges of using a destructive um, a weapon of mass destruction. That's federal, federal statute talk for a bomb. All right. Thanks a lot, Pete. We'll be watching this one closely. We appreciate it. You bet. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the man who received the first successful heart transplant from a pig has died two months after the procedure. We told you about David Bennett when he got the surgery in January. Doctors haven't said whether his death is connected to the transplant, only that his condition started getting bad a few days ago. Bennett was 57 years old. Number two, a new survey says over 10,000 hate incidents targeting Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders happened in the U.S. since the start of the pandemic. The group Stop AAPI has been tracking hate incidents from March 2020 to the end of 2021. Race was the main reason in over 90 percent of the reports. California had the most hate incidents, followed by New York. Number three, people in the U.S. can now order more free COVID tests online. The Biden administration is offering another round of at-home rapid tests as part of its efforts to combat coronavirus. 270 million tests have been delivered since January. You can get yours at covidtests.gov. Go there now. Tinder is offering a new safety feature. This is number four on its platform. The dating app is introducing a tool that will let users run background checks on prospective dates. Users get two free background checks and then they have to start paying $2.50 per search after that. The app even says it'll boot users with violent criminal pass. And number five, a ship that sank over a century ago was found off the coast of Antarctica. Look at these pictures, pictures how creepy they are. It was called the Endurance and belonged to explorer Ernest Shackleton. It sank in 1915, forcing Shackleton and his crew to escape. They all did, actually. The wooden vessel was found pretty much intact, with one official saying the preservation is, quote, beyond imagination. And you can tell just looking at it. We just heard from the White House about what it calls the, quote, tireless work it took over months to bring two Americans jailed in Venezuela back to the U.S. The Venezuelan government released Gustavo Cardenas and Jorge Alberto Fernandez after a rare trip by a high-level U.S. delegation to Venezuela over the weekend. Cardenas is one of six American CITCO execs who were arrested in 2017 on charges of embezzlement. The U.S. government has called it wrongful detention without a fair trial. Fernandez is a Cuban American tourist who was taken into custody under terrorism charges for bringing a drone to Venezuela. It's worth noting that this weekend visit from White House officials was the first in almost two decades. Gabe Gutierrez joins me now. Gabe, it's really nice to see you. It's been 20 years since a high-level delegation has gone to Venezuela. Why'd they go now? Tell me about this timing. Well, Stephanie, you know, we've been following this for years, basically, Sitco 6 was taken into custody several years ago, and that the timing of this is raising questions. Of course, it comes as the volatility in Ukraine is causing Russian oil inputs, uh, imports to be off the table. So there are a lot of questions about exactly why now. And Secretary of State Antony Blinken talked about that when he was asked at his news conference today. Take a listen. We have uh, an interest globally. Uh, in maintaining a steady, steady supply of, of energy, including through our diplomatic efforts. And, of course, uh, this is an ongoing situation, Stephanie. You talked about these two that have been released. There are at least four others that are being t detained in Venezuela right now. And so that is the question. What happens next for them? Um also, you have this announcement that we're not going to be buying Russian oil anymore, although it's a small part of our oil supply. We could be in a situation where Venezuela has a lot of oil. It, is that part of what's going on here? Certainly. You know, and the Biden administration's critics are pouncing on this, including Senator Marco Rubio of Florida, basically saying that we're cozying up to the Maduro government. And, you know, Marco Rubio is saying that, you know, even if we were to buy all the oil from Venezuela, it really wouldn't make a dent 
in Americans need for oil so why bother in his words cozy up to this uh, Maduro government of course technically Stephanie remember the US actually recognizes Maduro's opponent the opposition leader Juan Guaido as the actual president of Venezuela so the fact that they are meeting with the Maduro government at this point certainly is uh, you know, pretty remarkable. Also, NBC News spoke with the wife of uh, Gustavo Cardenas, Maria Elena Cardenas, this morning about how they're doing. And she says that, you know, right now it feels like a dream. They're incredibly yeah. happy right now. They've been waiting for the release of their husband, of her husband, for, for quite a long time. You know, again, they've been detained since November of 2017. Wow, so it's exciting days for them, but there are still, as you say, more people who are there. That's more right. Americans of the 606, four of them are still detained in Venezuela. We don't have any update on their status or their condition. Um, you know, their family members are still desperately trying desperate, to get Desperate, but out. perhaps a little bit more hopeful at this point, right? That's exactly right. Stephanie. All right, Gabe, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Still to come, a new message from Volodymyr Zelensky as the situation escalates in Ukraine. There's more talk of planned routes to get people out of the country. We'll talk about the hope that these humanitarian corridors could be as a path to safety. And Ukraine is trying to ramp up its evacuation efforts. We'll go to the Polish-Ukrainian border next for the latest. And breaking in just the last few minutes, we've got a new video from Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky where he reacts to the attack on a hospital in Maripol that we told you about earlier in the show. He's accusing Russia of, quote, a Ukrainian genocide, using the devastating attack today as evidence. Zelensky also directly addressed Russians, saying Ukrainians have never done anything like this because, quote, we are human. The Ukrainian president also used the video to again call on Western countries to set up a no-fly zone over the country. This morning, Russia and Ukraine reached a tentative deal to let civilians evacuate from Ukraine in six different areas. Here's what one of those evacuations looks like. This one is in the northeastern city of Sumy, and, and it all appears to be going pretty well there. It seems to be safe. Officials are saying more than 20,000 people have left in buses and cars along that established route alone. The problem here is that previous attempts to establish these safe corridors have, for the most part, failed because of Russian attacks. So trust that these routes will be kept safe is extremely low. And we've been talking about these so-called humanitarian corridors a lot over the last few days. But how do countries even go about creating a safe path for civilians to travel out during a war? We've got the details. Russia and Ukraine have finally agreed on protected escape routes for Ukrainian civilians after a lot of wrangling. They're called humanitarian corridors. It works by securing a ceasefire for a long enough time so that families and other civilians can flee the war zone unharmed, getting out to safety. The corridors also allow humanitarian aid to get in for those people staying behind. The first humanitarian corridors of the modern era were attempted in the Bosnian conflict in 1992. But U.N. soldiers and Bosnian civilians often came under fire from Serbian forces. One U.N. report found the corridors, which included the Sarajevo airport, allowed the Serbs to control incoming aid. More recently, humanitarian corridors were used during the civil war in Syria, which the Russians were deeply involved in. By 2016, Russian and Syrian fighters were often accused of violating the ceasefire agreements and bombing the corridors. Fast forward to now, the Russians and Ukrainians tried to come to an agreement on safe passage last week, but the Russian proposal only allowed civilians to escape to Russia or its ally, Belarus. Finally, yesterday, transports by the Red Cross successfully traveled Ukraine's first humanitarian corridor. The problem for the people of Ukraine now is that humanitarian corridors can only work if they are trusted. Ukrainian leadership says previous ceasefires have been violated. So the question is, will families and other civilians be willing to take the risk of using the corridors if they aren't sure they are safe? We're now going to Ellison Barber, who is on the Polish-Ukrainian border today. Ellison, you know, we talked about this earlier in the show. Local officials accused Russia of hitting a maternity hospital. How willing are people to trust using these humanitarian corridors when they hear about an attack like that? 
they, they weren't trusting them, quite frankly, prior to that. I spoke to a woman about two days ago in a makeshift refugee site inside a, of a tent where she and other moms who had fled eastern Ukraine were trying to get warm. And they were talking about how the idea of green zones, humanitarian corridors, were a farce. And as soon as she was saying that, everyone around her in the tent was nodding in agreement. They were talking about hearing stories, seeing it themselves, instances of civilian cars being targeted by, they said, Russian troops. I spoke to another woman at the border today, and, and she was describing seeing and her friends discussing it as well, a bus carrying civilians headed towards uh, the border away from eastern Ukraine being hit by shelling. So there was all already this immense distrust for these corridors to begin with and discussion amongst refugees we've spoken to in Poland saying that they had seen instances of it not being honored. This adds to all of that. But the fact alone that these routes headed towards Belarus and Russia, for a lot of people, that made it a non-starter to begin with. This attack, I think, confirms a lot of fears, a lot of things people we were hearing uh, discussed at camps, I think it confirms and solidifies uh, their hesitations with trusting these corridors. Stephanie? Yeah, and then, and then there's the possibility of, of getting trapped where they are as a result. You know, we're seeing civilians make their way across makeshift bridges. They're hearing gunfire behind them. You know, you're right there at the border today. What did people tell you? What have they been experiencing? Yeah, you know, we've been to six different border crossings in the last 12 days or so, and every wow. single time we keep hearing these stories of mothers just grabbing their children, at times telling them not to look around, not to look up, to just get to the train station or wherever it is they are going immediately so they can try to get to safety. I spoke to one mom today. I spoke to her daughters as well, and, and they described all of that for us, and it was very emotional. Listen. The road exploded. The railway exploded. And there aren't many people left in the city. The bombs are falling down on the city a lot and people are dying. It is so difficult. We want everybody to be alive. Wow. Mm. You know, one, one mom I was talking to today, she was showing photos and videos of the things that she had witnessed on the bus ride trying to get from eastern Ukraine to the Polish border with her eight-year-old daughter. And at one point, and this is graphic, but it's the reality of what's happening here, she showed a photo, uh, photos of, of Russian soldiers, soldiers who were dead along the way, along the road. And I asked her, I said, how do you help a child, your child, process that? I mean, most people, I think, would say that's something they never, ever want their child to see. And she said, at this point, this is what is happening in their country. She said, it is war. My daughter sees it. She has to understand what's going on because it's just the reality that they are dealing with every single day there. And that was the woman who was telling us in the same breath that she had seen a bus of civilians being shelled, being targeted, even though to her it was very clearly not a combatant uh, group of people, but still being targeted. And that gets back to this idea of why people don't trust those humanitarian corridors, Stephanie. Right, because, of course, the more important thing than even explaining it to your children is protecting them from it. Allison, thank you so much for your report. We really appreciate it. And concerns growing across countries in the Middle East and North Africa that the war in Ukraine will send prices of staple foods like bread way up. That's because Russia and Ukraine are both superpowers supplying a quarter of the entire world's wheat. And the price of wheat up 70 percent in the last month alone. It's bad news for countries like Egypt, the world's biggest wheat importer, or Ethiopia, a country in the middle of its own war. The invasion's already having a ripple effect, making the world's most fragile countries even more unstable. Now we want to give you another look into the lives of the Russian oligarchs. We've been hearing so much about it since the, the Ukraine invasion started. Tonight we focus on Oleg Deripaska. He came up after the fall of the Soviet Union, making most of his money in the aluminum business. But he's everything but your regular businessman. In fact, the U.S. has said he's actually threatened rivals with an allegation that he killed another businessman. He's, ever, he's even been denied a visa for trying to come here because of his alleged ties to Russian oligarchs. 
organized crime. Russia, in turn, has given him diplomatic status so he can still come and go as he pleases. So proximity to President Putin has been key to his success. Here's one of his yachts from a few years ago, because if you're an oligarch, you got to have a yacht. His current yacht is reportedly anchored in the Maldives. It looks lovely there. It's also, it happens, an island nation that has no extradition treaty with the United States. Tom Winter, you've been following all of these oligarchs. You've been kind of pulling back the curtain. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about Deripaska over the years and his relationship with Vladimir Putin. Well, it's not all yachts, models, and bottles with Oleg Deripaska. <laughs> He's been enormously successful in the aluminum business, and, and we'll get to that in the in the violent nature of it. But with respect to his relationship with Vladimir Putin, he's been described in leaked U.S. State Department cables as being one of the two or three closest oligarchs to Vladimir Putin. And like all close relationships, Steph, there's been ebbs and flows over the years as Deripaska has gotten in trouble with some of his business practices and, and his companies have had issues. Um, but overall, these two are quite close. He's an important figure. He's been targeted for sanctions before, and he's somebody that I think we'll continue to hear a lot about in the coming weeks and months as the U.S. ratchets up the pressure. There have been investigations, accusations. How come there haven't been charges at this point against Deripaska? I mean, this has been this ongoing cat and mouse game with the FBI now for over a decade. I mean, between the Russian organized crime allegations, the aluminum wars, you know, sometimes we use the word war just to describe a bitter fight. We're talking about people that died over the control of the aluminum business in Russia. And Deripaska's links to Russian organized crime are pretty extensive, according to U.S. officials. That's why he was denied that visa, as you mentioned. He is currently under federal criminal investigation. He says it has to do with sanctions. We've heard it might be something more. The FBI is being very tight-lipped, but they searched his home back in October. Uh, this investigation has definitely been ongoing. He was talked to during Special Counsel Mueller's case. It, it, we'll just have to see over time where this actually goes. Right, so I have big, two big questions. First, how much is he being hurt by these sanctions? And second, how much does he have to be hurt to split with Vladimir Putin and come out against this war? And is that even a possibility? If we see a real break in not just some of the statements that we've seen, which you could read kind of two different ways, but if we see a real break between Deripaska and Putin, I think that's a signal that there's a real break between the rest of the olig oligarchs and Putin. That's something we're going to have to watch closely. What would, uh, be the, what would be the first sign that there was that kind of break? I think if he showed up as a cooperator in ongoing federal criminal investigation and that he was going to plead guilty, something the oligarchs never do, I think that's going to be a big sign that there's a break there, that he's finally come over to the U.S. side. And for the FBI's purpose, they don't really care about the sanctions violations with, with Oleg Deripaska. They want to know what is going on inside Vladimir Putin's inner circle. If they can get that from him, that's a home run. That's what they're looking for. That would be a big break. So they would say, we'll give you a little immunity. Tell us what's going on. Exactly right. Exactly All right. right. <laughs> All right, Tom Winter, thank you very much. Sure thing. Appreciate it. Still ahead, a bizarre find for border agents in California after a man tried to smuggle, get this, dozens of reptiles. That's coming up in the local, in his clothes. And we're learning more about the incident where the director of Black Panther was mistaken for a bank robber in Atlanta. How Ryan Coogler is responding next. Negotiations went deep into the night as the MLB and Players Association try to reach a deal. Are they only closer to, are they any closer to reaching an agreement with games on the line? We'll get into it with Sam Brock in just a few minutes. NBC News covers hundreds of stories each day, and because you couldn't possibly read, watch, or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we like to call The Local. From our Southeast Bureau, a Texas election official is resigning after some serious issues with last week's primary. Over 10,000 ballots were uncounted in Harris County, leading to a delay in some of the results. There were also reports of machines malfunctioning. Administrator Isabel Longoria says she takes full responsibility for the mishaps. 
She'll officially step down July 1st. And from our West Coast Bureau, border agents in California arrested a man who tried to uh, slither in some reptiles. The man was driving a truck when he stopped at a border crossing in San Diego. That's when agents found 52 live lizards and snakes in small bags hidden in his clothes. It's not exactly clear what the man's intentions were, that's for sure. But authorities say some of the species found were endangered. And from our Northeast Bureau, a public university in Maine is wiping out about $2 million worth of student debt that built up during the pandemic. The University of Southern Maine is forgiving the debts of more than 750 students. The school's president says the move is to offer relief to students and let them know they can come back and finish their education. Well, that's great news for them. This next story has been trending online all day. A major Hollywood director handcuffed and mistaken for a bank robber, according to a police report. We're talking about Black Panther director Ryan Coogler. The filmmaker was questioned by police in Atlanta back in January after he tried to withdraw his money from a Bank of America. The report says bank employees thought the 35-year-old who was wearing a face mask and glasses was staging a robbery because he handed a note to a teller asking for at least $10,000 from his account. Here's a look at that police report. You see it highlighted. It says police, quote, determined that Mr. Coogler did pass a written, filled out withdrawal slip, withdrawal slip, with a note written on the back of the withdrawal slip to be discreet when handing him the cash. Our Blaine Alexander is joining us now from Atlanta. Blaine, this is a crazy story. The director confirmed the incident to Variety, saying that this should be a situation that should never have happened. So how did all of this unfold? Well, Steph, remember, all of this happened back in January. Of course, Coogler has been spending a lot of time in Atlanta recently. He's here filming the sequel to Black Panther, Black Panther Wakanda Forever. So all of this started, according to the police report, when he went into a Buckhead branch of uh, Bank of America with two people who were waiting in a black SUV in, in the parking lot for him to go inside. Now, according to the police report, essentially, like you said, he filled out the withdrawal slip, uh, asked for an amount higher than $10,000, and he handed it to the bank teller. But on the back, he had scribbled a note essentially saying, listen, please be discreet. Don't count the cash in, uh, in public because of the high amount. We also understand, according to a surveillance video, that he was wearing a COVID-19 mask. He was wearing sunglasses and a hat. Well, when the teller went to withdraw that amount, apparently it triggered some sort of alert on his account. This is according to the police report, and that made her notify uh, her, her supervisor essentially to say that there was a robbery in progress, and they called 911. Steph? You know, Blaine, there's an alert that you can't take out that much money, and then there's trying to rob a bank. It seems to me there's a lot of room in between those things. Is that, is that part of this discussion right now? You know, I think it is. You know, the police report goes on to say that when officers arrived, they went up to the two people who were in the SUV. They were like, hey, you know what? We're here with Ryan Coogler. He's a very big name Hollywood director, of course, uh, Oscar nominated uh, film uh, movie maker. They went inside. The two people in the SUV were never handcuffed. Coogler was, though. He was put into handcuffs. He was escorted out of the building. At some point, according to the report, the officers realized the mistake. They apologized to him, explained what happened. But according to the report, he asked for all the officers' names, their badge numbers. Now, remember, this happened back in January, so certainly some time between when we're all finding out about this and when the incident happened. In a statement to NBC News, Ryan Coogler essentially said, yes, this is something that should have never happened, but Bank of America apologized. They rectified the situation to his satisfaction and essentially they've moved on. Bank of America was also apologetic, saying that this is something that should have never happened. Steph. Blaine, did, did Ryan Coogler himself say he believed in some way this was because of the color of his skin? He did not say that in the statement. You know, he was very, uh, he was very brief in what he said. He, he basically said that he... Uh, you know, it shouldn't have happened, but that they've moved on. I will say that according to the police report, uh, according to the officer who filled out the report, the teller herself was a black person, a black woman who filled out the police report. But as this is making its way on social media, of course, the comparisons can't help but be made uh, and questions about perhaps the motivation behind this and why something like this happened. But Kugler himself uh, did not make that reference. Steph. All right. Thanks, Blaine Alexander, for walking us through it. We appreciate it. 
There's still some hope that we could see a full 162 game baseball season this year. Wouldn't that be great? Here's where we stand. Late last night, the baseball owners gave the players their latest offer. And a little while ago, the players sent the owners back a counter offer. And right now, the sides are going back and forth on individual items. The optimistic view is if somehow they can get a deal done today, players could head to spring training by the weekend. And we could get the whole season. But this lockout has been going on for 98 days. There's a lot a lot of money at stake and a lot of bad blood. So we really don't know which way this is going to go. Sam Brock joins us now to answer some of our questions. Sam, you know, where are we now compared to when we talked to you about this 24 hours ago? Is it any better? Yes. Yeah, Steph, Steph, good to be with you. It's not clear. It's been pretty opaque in terms of what sorts of agreements have or have not been reached so far between the players and the union. I will say I'll take the under on whether or not we have a full 162 game season at this point one series or I should say a couple of series one week has already been canceled the threat on the table right now for Major League Baseball is a second week here's the issue the movement that came up from the last 24 hours when we last spoke was that the Major League Baseball management and teams came up on their competitive balance tax offer originally it was 210 million that's now moved all the way up to 230 million for the first year of this five year CBA agreement what does that mean I'm talking Stephanie about the luxury tax. The players want more money, higher luxury tax, so that there can be more money disseminated by the teams to players. Their salaries would go up. But there is a serious issue in Major League Baseball with the level of competition. Check out this full screen that shows you the three or four teams with the biggest payrolls last year. Of course, the Los Angeles Dodgers are right on the top of that list at $260 plus million. You have the Mets and the Yankees just below it. They are four to five multiples higher than Cleveland, than Pittsburgh, than Baltimore. Baltimore. Major League Baseball does not want to see the haves and the have-nots separate even further. And I will say, I know you're a Red Sox fan, Stephanie. The Red Sox mm -hmm. might not be in the top three, but they're in the top mm -hmm. five or six. The big market teams have an advantage. So this CBT thing is a huge point. So is the international draft. That's the sticking point right now between the two sides. You know, it's convenient for you there, Sam, and your perch down in southern Florida to make that to make that allusion to my my fan base in Boston, but I'd have to point out that I think under this veneer of yours, you are actually a New York Yankees fan. Don't deny it. You're so close, but I'm a Mets fan, which they spend a lot of money. They just have not historically had the same amount of success as the Yankees. So really, it's the worst of both worlds if you really want to go after me. I'm living in a glass house, no question about it. <laughs> that is true. So I have a little bit more respect for you now that it's the Mets and not the Yankees. But you know, honestly, for the, for the baseball <laughs> fans out there, Sam, where do negotiations go from here? Are, are we, you say that you're not hopeful, but well, are we going to see some? Are we going to see some games this year, or are we looking at another all-nighter here in negotiations? I think you will see another all-nighter because, as you laid out, the amount of money that's at stake. We're talking about a nearly $11 billion industry, and the longer that this goes on, the teams are going to be hemorrhaging money. They eventually have to spend rebates back to the regional sports networks if they can't meet a certain number of games. Major League Baseball does not want to see that. But the bigger issue here right now is that there are serious sort of conceptual problems that aren't going to be solved quickly. The international draft represents one of them because you have this incredible wealth of talent in baseball. Literally, Steph, the best players in Major League Baseball. Juan Soto, Fernando Tatis Jr., Ronald Acuna, they were all international players that at the age of 16 could sign with any team that they wanted. The players want to keep that system going because they can become free agents earlier. Major League Baseball doesn't want to see that. These two are at loggerheads over that system. Is it going to be completely restructured? If they can't figure out some kind of compromise on that issue in the coming hours or days, this could go on for a while, and you definitely are looking at more games lost. This is already the second longest lockout in MLB history with 91 games canceled so far, Steph. Wow, Sam, it's sad for the fans. We hope they iron it out soon. Sam Brox, thanks for joining, joining yeah. us. That's a wrap for this hour. Vicki Wynn will be in this seat and have more for you tomorrow. Same time, same place. Coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.